Hey, Star Wars fans, Rule the Galaxy fans, it is Joe, and uh, today is going to be one of those one of those days that's some of my favorite days. While I enjoy <clears throat> thoroughly hanging out with my regular podcast crew, uh, I know I drive them crazy and make them have way too many shows and way too many get-togethers, and we have way too many guests, but every now and then, it's just good to do a little one-on-one -on -one chat with people we've met across the star wars community or the podcast community today's one of those days one of my favorite guys one of the guys that makes me laugh especially when he's doing the the blue whale voice on his um on his podcast geek out loud and i think we're now doing may or june madness on his show that is steve glosson of the geek out loud podcast how you doing steve i'm good man thanks for having me on again <clears throat> a lot of pressure because um, I, I have no plans of being funny ever. So I don't, I don't, I mean, like that's the problem. Sometimes when you get a reputation where he's so funny, like I could come in and say something serious, you know, like, well, you know, my, my cat died and everyone's like, Oh, he's so funny. What a funny guy coming in here acting like he's sad because his cat died knowing he doesn't like cats, you know, that sort of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get you. I get you. There is a lot of pressure. Um, yeah. There's pressure on all of it, you know. Being being the host of a show, there's pressure. Being the guy who edits a show, that's pressure. Trying to make it sound somewhat professional, even though it's just people talking into the uh, the internet here. Um, I, I get it, and um, you know, in my my neck of the woods, I'm the Star Wars guy. I'm the mm -hmm. talking guy, you know. And um, so I I think what really made it to where I really started enjoying and listening to your show was I was like here's a guy who's really similar to me he talks a lot he's he makes people laugh he talks about certain topics uh, you know but but i i will say that steve some of the times what what cracks me up the most about your show is i'm i'm really only i'm only good if i have someone to talk to mm. you on the other hand i can sit there and listen to you on your two and three hour marathons that you do and a lot of times it's just you and yes, there's a chat going on, on the side, but you can go for an hour or two and not need somebody to bounce things off of. And, and that is just not me. I people I say help. that people say that, but I'm like, I feel like I, I get to a point where I'm like, good night. I'm boring myself right now. <laughs> I need to shift gears and I'll get, I'll, I'll just be really bored with, with myself and what's going on. And so, um, I come away from most episodes these days thinking, wow, that was, you got to do better than that, Glosson. Why did you go three hours? Well, it's because I had, you know, eight soundtracks to get through to, to compare. Um, you know, hey, why don't you say this is really good or this is really powerful again? Talking about music, Glosson. Hey, mm -hmm. why don't, hey, is that an iconic score, Glosson? Of course it is. That's why it's in the running. So why don't you keep saying that? You know, th this is the dialogue in my head when I'm doing these things. Um, I, you know, for me, I had no one to podcast with when I started Geek Out Loud. Like mm -hmm. it was, there was just me in the community and, and I was, you know, I, I was kind of raised at the feet of, well, you know, my dad's a pastor. And so there's, you know, he's having to three or four times a week and some since, you know, every day, every night, you know, do a basically an extemporaneous speech, you know, for 30 to 45 minutes, um, Rush Limbaugh, you know, Rush Limbaugh mm -hmm. did, of course, now, listen, don't think there's no preparation to what Rush did or like Scott Rifen, you know, of course, Rifen takes too many phone calls on his show. Um, I've, I've told him repeatedly, I'm like, you've got to, you've got to shut the people up and we need to hear from you more. But, um, <clears throat> but there is, uh, you know, it, it can be a little daunting sometimes, it is and it is more fun when other people are there you know like that's mm -hmm. i think that's the thing that 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 i've realized over over the course of years is when there is someone that even if i can't even if they're not really great on the mic it's still interesting to try to draw something out of them you know and and get something there but then when you've got someone that you just have the chemistry with that just that you can just flow back and forth with it's that's that's when it's fun i i agree i i find that even though in the real world 
because I am the talker of all talkers and I keep conversations going. If we're out with people, if we're in a situation where there's a lot of people around, I think what I like on the podcast is throw out that hand grenade, right? Let throw out that question and then just sit back and watch what happens yeah. and take it all in. I, I found that stand I'm up stance. That's right. That's right. That's right. And you mentioned uh, Scott and doing the show, the show that he does every day. Um, you know, I have a friend who does that in Indianapolis. He's a morning talk show host from six to 9 AM. And my wife and I were talking about it the other day because I said, you know, when we run the podcast, you know, we got a timer going up in the, in the corner and I can see what's going on. And I said, you know, I have all kinds of respect for those kind of people who have to do that when they have to mix in news, traffic, weather, commercials, everything else, because we, we might have a guest on and it's it, the first half an hour is nothing but just banter and quick introductions. And then you look and go, well, this show is going to have to go an hour and a half or two hours because the first half an hour was just chit chat. We right. didn't get into any topic yet. So right. how, how does a guy who's like, okay, I've got four minutes to talk about this news story and then hit to a commercial and then come with a segue right back into my next story. I, I, I'm not sure I'd be very good at that. Well, you know, for, if you're, if you're in a professional setting, you, you have it timed down. So you're, you're watching a clock as you're doing mm -hmm. it, but also, um, you know, you have, you have your hard breaks where you have to, go to break, you know, and then you can fudge some of the other things. If you want, like, here's a picture of just unprofessionalism on the radio. When I was doing the big honking show in our local area, I was going seven to nine weekday mornings. And there were a couple of things that had to get out there to the people because it's a local radio station in a small right. town. So had to play the school lunch menus for the day. <laughs> had to, uh, <laughs> which that would give some some fodder in of itself. I'll yeah. swing back to the school lunch menus. But at the top of the hour, at the eight o'clock hour, it was time for obituaries. Huh. And so here I am trying to be silly in the morning, <laughs> you know, talking about the anim apocalypse or, or, uh, or, you know, some granny, you know, shooting shooting some dude who'd come into her house you know we're firing at him that sort of thing and just having a grand old time and then it's like wayne right in part of the funeral home announces the passing of and i mean you just go right into with this organ music behind it and everything and then there were days where and those were all pre-recorded but there were there was one or two days where i came in and in the fax machine because this studio still used a fax machine mm there was there'd be a piece uh, a, a paper there from one of the funeral homes in town with an obituary to be read in the morning so i'd have to do a live read i'd have to fire up the organ music on a, uh, on a not a cart but on an electronic cart and um and uh and and read you know go from <laughs> miles funeral home is that's sad to announce the death of, you know and and so um but then what you also had were local buys from churches. So you had a pastor or two who would come on and have a whole like devotional thought that would go five minutes, you know, or three minutes, you know, and <clears throat> they were paying the studio, they were paying the radio station sure. for, for that airtime. So you had to get those played, you know, and, it, and, and then there were some other spots that were not local, but they were regional you know, that were similar things. And like right. those things became part of the show because like people who were listening outside of Hazelhurst, outside of where I was broadcasting from, because we would do tune in, we would, we would go live on the tune in app as well. Um, so we had the whole, I call at that time it was the Twitter zoo crew. Cause that's how we were communicating with the listeners then. But that man, like those things became a part of, the show through those listeners. So when, when we stopped radio and we're back to just a podcast on, you know, over the internet, you know, there were things like, are we doing the birthday club still? You know, are we still doing <laughs> <laughs> Cause there was a time where I was trying to keep it going daily, you know, even right. though, um, it, you know, even though it wasn't on the, on the radio and, and, um, but I did not have the, I didn't have the discipline to wake up in the morning, do the show, and then get to my regular job if 
if there wasn't going to be dead air, right? You know, for for the city to hear. So, um, but yeah, those kinds of things. It's it's a, I, I guess it's a skill. It's you know, it, you just have to be willing to realize that there is an audience on the other side of this microphone, right? And that you are talking to people, and and I think that that's the one thing that some people you know, forget when they fire up a microphone for the first time, it's like they suddenly change, you know, and, and it's like this communicating that they're always able to do when the mic is on, they don't, they can't do it anymore. And like I say, I had the advantage of being raised, sure, you know, in a, in an environment where extemporaneous speaking is the rule of the day. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's to me though, it is fun when, when you've got people to bounce off of. You know, I, my son is, um, he's in the entertainment industry and, um, he will constantly, he calls himself like one shot, one shot Joey, because he'll say, Hey pop, I need you to, I'm going to, I'm going to riff on this and do a quick video that I'm going to post on a Twitter or Instagram or whatever. I need you to hold the camera right here. Just at this angle, sweep in, I'm going to record this and boom, boom, you know, we're going to get in, we're going to get out. And so he he just he knows he knows to hit his mark he knows boom boom right into right. it and you're you're right you don't think about it as being professional you think it's just some natural thing but when when he started first having me involved with him with rule of the galaxy when when he started it up in january of 2020 he was like hey come on be my co-host let's do this and i was going into radio joe you know i'd be yeah. like Hey Joey, now we're gonna talk about rule the galaxy. We're gonna, you know, and he he was like, Dad, Dad, no, just talk like you're having a conversation with the person on the other end of the microphone. Yeah. yeah. And I said, Really? And he so ever since then, even when we do something live on YouTube, when we do something live, I've just realized, you know what? I, I'm even though I'm seeing me and another person there, really, there's other people basically sitting right behind it that I'm just talking to them. Yeah. And it, it does become very much more relaxed. Um, he's been doing, he's been doing some reads for uh, TV shows and movies recently. Oh, cool. And so in the old days, obviously you'd have to sit there at paper and look back and forth with the person, right. And, and do the reads. Now he will send me a link. Let's say hop on zoom or hop on Streamyard. I will sit here with his script on one screen and with him on the other screen, he'll say, you're reading one, two, you're reading those three parts. I'm reading this guy. And I will sit here with just like you and I are doing. And I will literally be looking at this screen, reading the parts, what, then watch him read his parts and go back. It's, it's amazing. I've always wanted to be in the entertainment industry. I, I was a radio DJ back when he was first born. I was on the ESPN station. I called them and I was like, I can do this. And they said, well, you think you can do this? Come in and do it. This is 30 years ago. And they put me on the air. A guy co the guy hosted it. I was his co-host. I did it for like a year, year and a half. Oh, so you were doing like sports talk on an ESPN? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I had to do that. And there were days where he missed, or there were days where he'd be like, Hey, I have an interview at noon. I can't mm -hmm. make it. Can you call this guy and record the interview? And I'd say, sure. And I would go do that. Yeah. And that's where the radio Joe came in because I'd be like, Hey, you're listening to W J E R, you know, and, and that's not me at all, but you get into that mentality. Right. You think um, that's what you have to do. Yeah. You think yeah. you have to do it. But so back then I was like, I, I can do this. And then kids got in the way jobs got in the way. I said, I kind of got away from it. But then as Joey said, get back into this podcast right now for me to sit here with either you or guests or whatever, that feels as natural to me as, as having a conversation with family members or friends. Sure. It's, it's yeah. very weird. Yeah. Well, that, and that's how it has to be. And I think that when, uh, I, I don't know, there, there's a whole, there's been a whole movement in the podcast arena, especially when it comes to entertainment podcast, um, done by people who aren't necessarily in the business. You know, you've mm -hmm. got the entertainment podcasts that are, that were started by the various stars of shows or, you know, personalities that were already out there. But when it's the peons like you and I, you know, who are just jumping into this stuff, th there's been this whole kind of shift where um, it becomes th there's there's a there's a dual purpose in it for a lot of people. I think on one hand, they just like to talk about the stuff. But on the other hand, they suddenly get an interview 
mm-hmm. or they get reached out to by someone's publicity and suddenly the access bug starts kind of lighting up, you know, in their brain and it becomes all about access and, and they want, they want access to the, the, the next premiere. They're hoping for access to the next star up the ladder, you know, and, and, and then what happens because they want that access, they start towing the line of a certain narrative mm. and, and that narrative then is, you know, whatever they think the studio wants them to say, they'll, they'll say, and they'll do. And I, you know, I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I've been guilty of that with one show that I did with Derek and it was the Terminator show. That was the sky next. It was the Terminator. The Sarah, it was our reaction show to Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles. And I think without realizing it, what was happening then was I was kind of being put in a position where we were wanting to Mm -hmm. kind of be, start to be the, TV and film sci-fi people. Cause we, we had such success with the Smallville show. Derek did. And I was fortunate enough to be brought on with that. And then as we were doing Sarah Connor, it was really interesting because we started out and I'm telling you what, I was bored out of my gourd doing that show. <laughs> um, but we were trying to be very straight about it. We were trying to just kind of, you know, here's what we think. Here's our, and I, you know, and I made some pretty bold statements as far as how well written the show was. And I do think it was a very well written show back in the day. Um, I think when you start delving into time travel and issues like that, it can get tricky, but I do think for what was happening on that show, it was a very well written sci-fi show. Um, and then next thing we know, Brian Austin green's reaching out to us because they listened and that sort of thing. That's great. You know, that's wonderful. Um, but that show became actually fun and entertaining when we dropped all the pretense and started going off on our tangents, having a good time with things, you know, having some in jokes and, and when it stopped being about, Oh, I hope they know us, you know, and right. turned into, we're just going to have a good time, you know, and if we really enjoy this then let's enjoy talking about it. And, and that was a real lesson for me in as much as if I'm going to, do something i want to enjoy doing it and i've tried things on the show here and there that were great one time and then we kind of ran them into the ground because you know it worked that one time and it was fun and then it stopped being fun and it stopped being fun for me i should say right and and unfortunately the other people don't realize that it's like well listen if i'm bored you're eventually going to get bored yep if i'm bored doing this just to keep you you know just because and I know there's a, you know, you want to, you want to go along with the listeners to an extent, but if I'm bored talking about this stuff, eventually you're going to be bored and I'm going to be bitter. And then I'm going to turn into an insult comic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're right because we do the shows and, and we're nowhere near your two and three hour marathon guys. Uh, we, you know, we're usually hour, hour and a half. And, but what I will say is we have myself, Alfie, my cousin, who knows everything about Star Wars. We have D-Doc, who's my son's age and who lives in Philadelphia. And then we have Brent, who we always joke because he's kind of like the guy who grounds us because we're all pie in the sky kind of people. And Brent's very much stick in the mud kind of person. Mm -hmm. And so we'll talk about a topic and he'll just be like, you know, guys, this blah, blah. And we're like, ah, Brent, man, you're bringing us back down to earth. Let us live in the clouds, right? And, but it works because of that. It works because we have a guy in his fifties, two guys in their forties and a guy in their thirties, all who come from different backgrounds and do different things. And so that's what makes it fun for us. We, we enjoy that camaraderie. We enjoy that back and forth. We enjoy Brent going, Joe, you're running around like a rabbit, slow down and just have fun with it. Right. While everybody else is kind of like going in regular speed, I'm on fast forward um you're right though about the interviews and the connectivity because when we interview someone like vanessa marshall i mean we're on a high for a week we sit there going we just talked to we just talked to hera for an hour right and we're like who are we how did we do that um when i did an interview for half an hour and i was just part of the interview with ian mcdermott and i'm looking across the table and he's three feet away from me and I'm like, I'm looking at the freaking emperor right now. 
mm-hmm. and I'm talking to him. How does that make sense? Yeah. You you do get on that high. You get on that, oh my gosh, what's next? Where am I going? What are we doing? We've had a really good run, and, and I'm sure some of you have listened. We had Graham Hancock, who's got the upcoming Lego book coming out, which looks fantastic. We just had uh, Mark Sumeric, who is... He's writing all the secrets of Star Wars, secrets of the Sith, secrets of the Jedi, the bounty hunters, the clone troopers, the Wookiees. They're all great, which, by the way, he said the first hundred episodes of Fantastic Four is what comics and Marvel Universe is all about. So mm-hmm. I thought you'd enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, we do. We sit there. and We're like, huh, our friend Ryan McGee has Billy D. Williams on. How do we do that? And then I, I'm not sure. Is that what we're supposed to do? I don't know. Mm. But but you do. You get on a high. You can't get away from it. And you're thinking, what's next? What's next? When really, we just do this for fun. Yeah. And I think that I think that's the key. You know, it's knowing who you are. Uh, you know, if if my identity is wrapped up in how many listens Geek Out Loud gets, um, if my identity is wrapped up in how many, you know, positive reviews I get on Geek Out Loud, or any, then then what happens is is all of my energy is poured into something that's fake. You know, all of my life is poured into something because as fun as this is and as Mm -hmm. cool as this is, it's not real life. You know, it's like we, we said off mic, you know, there's something to be said for the getting together, sitting around a meal, just having real conversation and not, not necessarily trying to, um, you know, entertain the masses by doing, you know, David Attenborough, Star Wars, <laughs> galaxy creatures, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then, and then when you stumble onto bits, yeah. you know, the, then it's fun. But, but, but this, at the, at the end of the day, there's still a camera and miles and miles of fiber optics between us. You know what I mean? Right. And, and, and there's still an audience that we are, that I have bored to tears now because we've said nothing about Star Wars. Um, and, and I think that I think that what we have to realize is none of this is real. None of the stuff we talk about is real. And if we get our identity wrapped up in it too much, because yeah. at the end of the day, I've not I've not put a dime into the production of these things. I've not put any any creative effort into uh, into what Lucasfilm is producing at all. Yep. And my life, and it does not if if it sucks, it doesn't affect my life. You know, if it's great, it doesn't affect my life outside of I enjoyed it or I didn't enjoy it. Now I move on because right. because, you know, I've got a family, I've got a job, I've got other things that have to take my attention. And I think when we can get those things in the proper perspective, then when we're having a conversation with someone like Vanessa Marshall, um, you know, you realize, well, this is just another human being. And she has a little bit more stake in the game than I do. But what I love about her is she she gets it, you know, it's like, she's one of us. And, um, and so you can sit there and talk the geeky stuff and have a good conversation with her and, uh, but, and just be a person. And I, and I think that that's kind of the thing that, again, that has frustrated me a little bit about some of fandom is people have stopped being people, you know, they, they, and they've started being, you know, very much like almost like militant about, things and it's and it's really it's a strange phenomenon really you know because it's pop culture you know and i guess i guess back in the day you know metalheads didn't like disco fans and you know and 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 certain pop culture facets you know had rivalries with other pop culture facets but you know the the flame wars that have come about because of the internet is what's really intriguing in in a way in a in a sick way really Real quick, am I sounding okay? You get any feedback or echo or anything? No, you sound great. Am I echoing over on your end? No, I just wanted to make sure I I didn't we didn't check or talk about that before we started, so I thought I would throw that in there. Um, y- yeah, Steve, I'm not going to get into a deep thing on this, but I would just say this is just a mimic of society in general because we look at the world oh, and yeah. y- you know you have people come out and say their true beliefs on something and they're ridiculed and lambasted. And is that how you say it or lambasted? Lambasted. Um, um, but, but, you know, for just Lamb- saying. Lambasted is, is what is, is, is something that's a dish in Greece, I think. <laughs> yes. There's a lambasting class if you take a trip to, to Greece. Um, but, but, so it just, 
it's trickled itself down to where people used to say, well, politics and religion, we're going to get that heated about it. And everything else is just fun. You know, your team, your, right. your hobby. And now it's trickled down to all that. So it's the same way. And, and I will tell you, there are some super sweet, great people that I've met in this industry, in this, this world that we're in right here in the community that I love interacting with. I love you talking to, but they are completely, if Lucasfilm puts something out, the first thing they do is throw a parade, say how much they love it. <laughs> uh, and then basically sit there and go, Oh no, by the way, look at this box of swag that they sent me. Right. And yeah. we joke about it here because we're like, man, I feel like we do a pretty good podcast. I I'm, I'm not, I'm not seeing that now. I say that. And, and the people at inside editions, sent me this oh, no that's nice which is i read through most of it the other day and then i skimmed through the rest of it what what is that now this is inside editions return of the jedi visual archive wow. see you, you there's so many little insights i love it, that cover oh the cover is great and then like they've got pages where as you can see fold outs of I things that's that an artwork yeah wow oh yeah so i mean we sit there and i'm like wait a minute, John Jackson Miller's people sent me a book to read. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. the visual guide for return of the Jedi. That's incredible. Um, so I, I'm, I'm joking about them, but I'll take the free stuff. Let's sure. Stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but at the same time, are you expected to review? Are you expect, you know, that's kind of the thing. It's like, yeah, what, what is now expected of you because you receive that. And if there's nothing expected, it's just kind of a, Hey, if you want to talk about this, great. If you don't, you know, that's fine too. Then, then wonderful, you know, but outside of that, uh, you know, I've re listen, I've received a thing or two in my day, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I'm very appreciative of it. But at the same time, I, there are a lot of times where I probably disappointed whatever company sent me a thing or two, because I would forget to bring it up on the show. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, um, I, I have a, qu a quick question for you. Great. You you've mentioned YouTube on your show quite a bit. You you've yeah. talked about the the world of YouTube and how they've clamped down on certain things, they push certain things. We've been doing the podcast since January of 2020, and mm -hmm. our numbers were doing well, going up. You know, we've been very consistent once a week for the most part for four and a half years. Um, and the numbers have kind of said, okay, here's your listeners, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we year and a half, whatever ago, we started putting the show on YouTube. And we saw that per show, we get X amount of viewers. People would watch it on YouTube. Our numbers dipped a little bit in the podcast, but they went up a little bit in the YouTube. And so I was like, oh, more people are watching on YouTube now. That's kind of cool. Great. But never hellacious numbers. Mm -hmm. And then recently I said, you know, this DDoc keeps saying YouTube's where it's at. So I took all the, I took like 10 shows and I could hit a button on StreamYard and it would create me like four or five YouTube shorts, hmm. which are 45 to 50 seconds long. Yeah. And all I have to do is copy them, drop them into YouTube, and they show up as shorts. And we'll get four and 500 views on each one of these shorts we put yeah. out. So I took a show that you recently did with me. And I took a show that Steve Sansweet recently did hmm. with me. And I said, I'm going to make minute or two segments out of that because I think they're really good and they're fun. Right. And I post them and I'll get very few views yeah. on videos that I create that mm -hmm. aren't shorts, um, yeah. four or yeah. 500 views on shorts, but I'll put a minute segment of Steve Sansweet talking about how he's going to blow up Rancho Obi-Wan right. or how he took the, the, the stuff from the burning Qui-Gon Jinn on Phantom Menace, put it in his pocket after they, wet it down and put the fire out and it looked like he peed his pants because he had <laughs> wet stuff in his pocket. So the title of the show was if I'm, you know, it being cool, if peeing your pants is cool on Steve Sansweet, that was yeah. the title. And I yeah. thought, man, hundreds of people are going to read this right. or watch this. And and like 30 people yeah. looked at it, yeah. but shorts versus minute two or full shows, nothing. It's right. amazing how that works. Well, th that's that doom scroll thing, isn't it? That's where YouTube has jumped on the TikTok or Instagram reel kind of concept. And so more people are going to be thumbing through and to keep that content, those short content feeding, 
YouTube's just sending it to the people's algorithms and everything. But the long form stuff with the YouTube generation, the YouTube crowd, I sound like an old man. The YouTube yeah. generation. Um, <laughs> ah, you just came to YouTube. I was born to it. Um, <laughs> that that type of thing doesn't quite. There's a there's a very niche audience for a long form podcast, a long form YouTube show, that sort of thing. And unfortunately, um, I don't think people realize even that the stuff we talk about is very niche. It feels like it's taken over the world because right. of the tent pole films and everything else. But there, there, there's uh, there's a lot of people that'll go watch the movies. There's a lot of people that'll tune in the TV shows, but that's all they want. Right. You know, they don't want to see us talking about it. You know, all the time. They they want to. Uh, they they would rather. Um, just go watch the stuff and, and then go on with their lives, you know, out of, so, sight, out of mind. Yeah. Right. So what we do is, is very, very niche and, um, and, and I'm okay with that. And that me, and what that means is, is we're not going to get the, the views, <laughs> you know, we're not yeah. going to get the, the things I, I, I really, it really truly is a thing where I had to decide I'm just going to do stuff for fun. Yeah. Um, and and if and if it catches on great if it doesn't that's fine too you know um it it i i don't want to put a ton of work into things i want what i what i've what i've discovered is is i want to get better at my craft you know i want to get better at the hobby of podcasting i want to get better at doing some video work and that sort of thing i want to get better you know because who knows where else it'll help me out sure but, um, and if I can do it messing around with stuff that I enjoy, then all the better, you know? No. I, so I agree. You know, because, well, you know, Star Wars day is coming up. Um, the official, the official Star Wars day. Yeah. As, as yeah. Ryphon says, Orthodox Star Wars day. Um, and, and I'm really looking forward to on, on the geek out loud YouTube, um, posting a little video of mediocre, action figure photography using vintage star Wars figures and toys, you know, Love and it. maybe some not so vintage. I don't know. Um, I just have to clear off my desk and stand some figures up and take pictures, you know, and, and then put some music behind it and yep. put it out there to the masses and let them have at it, you know, and, and if people like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. I'm no, I'm no action figure reviewer. I'm no, uh, I'm no action figure photographer. Um, I'm no, you know, I'm not good at any of it. I'm, I'm mediocre at best. And so I just lean into that and have a good time. You have to have things that make you happy. And I will tell you recently, I've been toying with the idea, not being a great photographer or, or filmographer, um, but listening to your show and hearing you promote the people who are good at that. Something that stood out to me that I've been wanting to do, maybe you'll take it over for me because you'd be even better at it than I would is I want to take the, 1978 Luke Skywalker in the shorty outfit. Mm -hmm. Then I want to take the powers of the force Luke Skywalker. Then I want to take a black six inch series of that. And I want to, I kind of want to do a different angle and view of each one next to each other mm -hmm. to get the comparison. Like in, in the little, the little adventures where it's a little chubby guy, you know, when he's holding a gun and he's, Oh yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I kind of want to have like three or four different versions of each character and have them next to each other to where it's like, from what I grew up with to my kid growing up with to what what's going on today. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because I think a lot of people are really good at showing like the completely just awesome six inch black series that are, you know, however many things of, of oh, yeah, the articulate, super articulate. Yeah. I, I think it would be really cool to say, Hey, you know what? I love this one. And all he could do is move his head and his arms. Right. Right, and, and, his little, yeah. and his little lightsaber came out of his that, arm. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. I was like, I kind of want to do that, but I don't know if I have the time to just take like ten or twelve characters and do each one of them. Like Ben from '78, Ben in the Black series, which um, they came out with the the you know re, the anniversary yeah. edition, yeah. and have yeah. him stand next to him and be like, hmm, how what's the difference on this? And just check him out and everything, but. Though that's something that popped in my head just from listening to you talking about how much you enjoy, you know, that the, the one, one you of my collecting regrets is not picking up those uh Kenner style 
or Kenner inspired black mm. series figures. Um, cause they did, they did the Obi-Wan, they did Greedo. Uh, there was one more, I feel yep. like they did. Um, there, there were a couple of they did, I thought, and and I just I really regret not grabbing those because those I, really scratched an itch that I didn't know I had. I think in this format right here, well, I know they're doing it now because like I bought the Empire Leia in the Hoth outfit, I bought uh, the Empire Lando in the blue cape, and they mm -hmm. were doing them like this. I missed the Star Wars ones, so I went back and bought the Luke, the Ben, the Leia, the Darth Vader. Just because this is what I grew up with. And right. I was like, I want to have them. Uh, I saw him taking it out of the case. And I should because he looks really cool. But but yeah, those... I think the ones on that card stock really appeal to me more than the ones that are uh, in the in the box. I, well, yeah. And that's... And that, I look, that, was, that was Hasbro's big... I don't... I, listen... I don't want to give them too much credit because people had said for years before they finally did it, just go back to the original packaging mm -hmm. because it's, it's dynamic. It is. And I'm sure it has something to do with shelf space. Those cards take up a little more room than the box does as far as the, you know, the width of it and everything. But, um, but like you go to the vintage collection, like the vintage collection was successful initially, not because they were doing, necessarily different characters and stuff in on a vintage card it was because it was on a vintage style card um you know and if you notice every other attempt they've made has kind of gone by the wayside right and the vintage collection lives on because that was a try for you know for people our age for what six years seven years that was Star Wars figures, you know, that was, and that's the foundation. That's the basis of it. Same thing they're doing with GI Joe has broke, you know, they're, they're finding that real American hero artwork and card and putting it on the right. But, and so suddenly for people our age, there's a nostalgia hit. And I don't know what kids are doing for toys anymore. Joy, Joe, you've got great grandchildren. Um, grandchildren. Not oh, I'm, great sorry, grandchildren. Right, right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Joe, <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you've got great great grandchildren. Um, what, what, uh, what kind of toys are they playing with these days? That is a good question, and I can only give you an answer based off an eighteen month old little boy. Okay. Um, he does not care. He likes the twelve inch Star mm -hmm. Wars figures. Yeah. That I, I've got a bunch of them out of the box. The mm -hmm. the the more nineties and two thousands version. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not the not the an, antique ones, but. Um, so he yeah. likes those cause they're big and he can smash them against each other. Sure. He, he really likes the chubby little people, the ones that are those cute little play sets. The galactic he, heroes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely Lucas loves called them, them. They're squishies. They're squishies. Yes. Yeah. He freaking loves those. He will sit there and play with all of those. Um, honestly, if to him, it's about putting things into things and taking things out of things. That's his big play thing is, oh, I've got four guys. Oh, they'll all fit in this. And then he opens it up and takes them all out and puts other guys in. Um, that and um, race cars and race car tracks. So because he can just set a car on it and it'll just go right oh, down yeah, the track. Yeah, I mean, yeah. um, so those those things catch his eye. Uh, but I haven't seen yet and I've got boxes of them. And I don't even have a big collection. I've got a small collection, but... I've got boxes of toys from the 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. 90s, you know, the early 2000s that I've opened and they were played with that I can't wait to um, see what he does with them. Mm -hmm. But I, I I do not know how that's going to happen yet. But the galactic ones, he eats those up. And, yeah, yeah, those were, that was a great, I, that was one of the last great ideas I think that Hasbro had. Um, or I guess those weren't even Hasbro, those were play school. Um, <clears throat> which may be a subsidiary of Hasbro. Um, regardless, the Galactic Heroes thing, I had a, 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 I was friends with a family that had a little girl, and she she was like four, and picked up on the whole Star Wars thing, and so mm -hmm. they started. We started buying her those, and she loved them, man. Like that was her jam, and completely would just pull them out and line them up, and, and you know that sort of thing, and um. And, and so, yeah, I think 
th- those and and then with collectors there was overwhelming popularity because yep. you know it was that got to collect them all kind of mentality with those things but you know it, it that was a great concept because it it encouraged kids to play i don't know that kids are going up and down the toy aisle and seeing a star wars action figure and saying hey i got to have that because i just yeah. don't know that it's in there in their world anymore. And and especially with screens and everything like that today, you know, I don't, I don't know that kids play with toys like we used to back in the day. And I'm not, I'm not bemoaning that as an old man yelling at clouds. I'm saying, I just think it's a fact of life. And, and, and so I, I, I don't know. I, I think regardless of what some people say, insiders and everything say, I think there's a narrative they push, you know, that, well, you know, these really are successful. These really are for kids. You can't tell me that a Marvel Legends figure is 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 marketed to kids when it's on right. a retro card, when it's on a Spider-Man, the animated series card, you know. Um, I, I just, I, I have a hard time believing it, you know, um, especially when it's not, eight-year-old kids aren't tuning into Hasbro fan pulse streams Right. to see what the big pipeline reveals are, you know, right. like that's that they're, they're catering to adults and that's fine. I, you know, there's at some point, there's nothing wrong with that. Lean into your audience, but it also, that means you're going to have a very vocal audience when things don't quite go right. well or don't, or don't seem right. You know, as far as the way they do things, for example, um, here is retro carded, uh, a retro series Phantom Menace set of six figures that we're going to put all in one box. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an exclusive, you know, to target maybe, I don't know. Um, but good luck finding it and good luck affording it, you know? Right. And same thing with that return of the Jedi box that like everyone wanted Mon Mothma. So they said, well, we'll just repackage some of these other figures and, you know, do vintage to all these other figures and stick them in there. Here's a yak face. Here's Mon Mothma. Now pay us $70 for other figures that you may already have. Right. And I just feel like, you know, they know what they're doing. You know, I, I just want to look at someone like, you know what you're doing. And <laughs> and if you really want to be retro about this, then keep release, you know, the next wave, release something from this last wave so that people who missed it can pick it up, you know, and, and just but they, you know, they're they're creating a, a demand so that we'll all jump after, it, you know. I think you and I spoke about this before. I mean, we're we're building we're building society to where the entire toy thing will fade away. I mean, it, it will fade away to a certain extent. Action figures when it comes to Star Wars or G.I. Joe or whatever, it, those things will fade away because guys my age, your age, you know, down to maybe people in the thirties who grew up with uh, the the uh, power of the force and all that. They're they're going to stop being a part of it, <clears throat> and every kid I see these days is either into Star Wars because of the video games, yep, or Legos. That's, yeah, that's yeah. the two things. And you know, we had Graham Hancock of that the the new Star Wars Lego uh, Force of Creativity book that's coming out uh, this this summer. Um, he came on as a guest, and I said, Graham. I'm I'm of the belief that Legos has far surpassed the action figure realm of of what we do in Star Wars because you go into the action figure aisle and there's two pe- two lines of pegs for action figures most of them are empty or people who've been hanging on the pegs for years yep Lando you, you go to the Lego aisle half of the aisle is Star Wars ships play sets mm-hmm. dioramas all that stuff yeah and then you add in, oh, by the way, we're going to make Lego video games mm-hmm. and Lego movies to where the kids are seeing that and saying, yeah. now I can go do that instead of just holding a three and three quarters character in my right. hand that doesn't right. do much. And those Lego games, man, they're 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 my jam. I, I will sit down and get lost. <laughs> and, and like, it doesn't matter if it's Lego Star Wars, Lego Indiana Jones, the Lego superhero stuff like I they're great games and they're so much fun, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, but then there's also, and I don't know how I feel about this. There's also the adult Lego people, you know? And I, and look, I get, I've got some Lego sets and they're really, you know, again, it's something, in fact, during the pandemic, um, 
my wife and I put together, I'd bought for myself years before the Ewok village mm -hmm. set. And um, I had more disposable income at that point in my life. And, and I'd never opened it, never put it together. So during the pandemic, we, you know, a few nights we took to sit down together and, and build the, the Ewok village. Great fun time, you know, and it was a good time for both of us just to hang out and do something together. And she really enjoyed it. And it is an enjoyable thing. You know, it's kind of like a puzzle with the solution there. And, mm -hmm. all, and I like to sit down with a big puzzle and do a puzzle. You know? So, but they're so expensive. Yeah. It's not a hobby I can really get into, you know? And I was talking to Michael Mercy about something similar about our, about our days as kids. When for me, I didn't have everything of, of one or two things. I might've had a lot of star Wars and a lot of he man and a little less GI Joe and a few transformers, but I didn't have everything right. of anything. And, and I think that, you know, as an adult, I had to kind of come back around to that thing and be like, it's more fun to just kind of have a mixture of things, you know, so that you don't have to have every Lego set. You don't have to have every, you know, but the things you have, you enjoy and you, right. and you, and you appreciate more because they're yours, you know, they're, they're, they're your deals. I, one of the first things. Thing, one of the first big purchases I made as a kid, I was like 10 or 11 years old. And there was a Optimus Prime that it wasn't the original Optimus Prime. It was the, what, what was called, um, well, it was a second release. It was a new, it was a new version of him. Oh, what were they called? Anyhow, he had a little robot that was like the engine and he had to be plugged into him to be able to transform Optimus. And he made a whole little fort and everything. And, um, Anyhow, it was like a $30 transformer back in the day. Mm. Now, today, nowadays, that size transformer would be, you know, 60 or 70. But um, I put him on layaway at Walmart in our town, and I mowed grass over the course of the next few weeks and brought in $10 every week to, to, uh, to do that. It was a great, great time. It was mine, you know. So you're frozen. still being recorded or not it shows i'm being recorded joey marinara is not here so now it's just me talking hoping that Streamyard is recording i feel like maybe he lost power sometimes in indiana they'll lose power it's a weird phenomenon that takes place where you hear hey so and so lost power i guess in georgia where we've got like three nuclear plants you know and that's that's probably why um George is going to be blown off the map one of these days. Not that the nuclear plants will explode nuclear. Because they're, they're more meltdown kind of things. Now it is just me. And <clears throat> who knows what StreamYard is doing, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Rule the Galaxy. Now that Joey's not here, I really want to dig into some things with you. First of all, I want to talk to you about, uh, about the Rancor. The Rancor was this incredible thing that we saw when we saw it for the first time, it was gross. It was slimy. It was scary. And, and Luke Skywalker beat it with a rock with a rock, you know, now granted a rock and a giant gate, but still, um, that's one of the things I never had in my collection was the rancor. Uh, and now you can't buy a rancor, you know, it's, you might as well be buying a real rancor because that's, that's how expensive they are. Um, but man, what a scary, what a scary monster. What a, what a great thing that Star Wars had and, and figured out with all of the different uh, um, uh, creatures and beasts of of the wars. You know, I, I know the temptation is to go into David Attenborough, but I don't think I will. Um, what else do we want to talk about? Let's see. 3D printed like stuff and cardboard backgrounds. Back in the day, 
for those of you who are uninitiated, but most of you probably are because you you watch the show and you're Star Wars fans. Um, there were a couple of sets. One was a cantina play set that was put out, I think, by Sears, and the other was a um, a Bespin uh, play set. And these were literally just cardboard, flimsy cardboard, almost like what a Happy Meal is made of. Maybe even a little bit more flimsy than that. Um, and and they had images on them from the movie. So the cantina had the image of the cantina on there. Um, the uh, the 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 Bisbon had you know Cloud City stuff on there, and there was like a whole it folded out and folded up and folded out. And there were figures that came with them, and that's where the blue snaggletooth came from with the cantina thing. Anyway, nowadays there's different people who are doing great things. They're doing cardboard like they're doing that they're doing the cardboard dioramas and they're you know i mean <clears throat> look you're going to play you're going to pay someone who produces these things 35 40 bucks for for one but they're quality and they're and they're fun and um i think they're made for three and three quarter stuff let me pull i'll pull that up real quick and see what i can find here um just to kind of give you an idea but it's really a neat thing and then there are these people that are doing 3d printed stuff and i saw a video recently of a guy who had gotten a 3d printed like java um palace kind of thing not what hasbro had done for the new stuff but like a more more in line with the vintage stuff so uh cardboard galaxy oh is he not on oh no is Cardboard Galaxy not on? Yeah, the Cardboard Galaxy on eBay has got a indoor uh, backdrop kind of thing. He's got the Moss Eisley streets, um, you know, that that fits in. And these are all three and three quarter inch scaled things. Wow, I should have. But like you're looking at 28, 30 bucks, 28 for Navarro. There's a giant Death Star hangar backdrop that you can actually put the Millennium Falcon in. Um, that'll fit with the vintage thing. Uh, goodness gracious, Theed Palace, all kinds of stuff. Joey Marinara has now texted me. Um, um, I'm still recording as far as I know, still recording. LOL. The Echo Base Hallway. Oh, he's only got one of those left, 28 bucks. Uh, the carbon freeze chamber thrown, you know, with the big window. I don't know if that window bust out, but that'd be cool if you'd make it like that. Um, let me see here about my internet speed. Do an Ookla test. Ookla. Ookla the muck. What y'all know about Ookla the muck? Oh, yeah, I'm still rolling strong. I'm still going strong internet wise so um yeah what y'all know about ukla the mock you know ukla the mock was from uh he was basic see they try to say that he's not oh I, I i saw somewhere where someone's like he's not a wookie ripoff he's not ripping off chewy but he is and i don't think it was brave Star. it was thundar thundar the barbarian now i'm going to pull up some information about Thundar the Barbarian for you. Thundar the Barbarian uh, was on Saturday mornings. It was from 1980 to 1981. Um, it was a Ruby. I thought it was a Hanna Barbera production, but it says it was a Ruby Spears production. Um, and it's a post apocalyptic thing. And there's this whole laser sword deal that goes on with it. He's got a villain that looks, you know, he's a, dude in a dark mask and that sort of thing. Um, Ookla the Muck, who's a, now look, he's a lion kind of ape thing, but he's a Wookiee, let's be honest. So, because, but that's all right, because it was, it was the time of Star Wars. You know, when you, when you hit 1977, and you know this, I don't know why I'm saying this, I'm just feeling time. When you hit 1977 and Star Wars is released and takes the world by storm, mind you, what happens is, is everything, just like today in entertainment, everything tries to be some version of that. So you end up with Battlestar Galactica. I know, I know, Battlestar Galactica is its own thing. Um, <clears throat> but 
you can't deny the the Star Wars influence and the fact that the the studio saw this said, hey, this could be our Star Wars. So obviously they took it. Now I know that the, the outside of being in space and having a few like dog fights with with um with spaceships and everything that there's the the differences are not all there uh or that the similarities you know kind of stop there but it can't be denied that the reason that um that the network went ahead and, and greenlit that was because of the the fame of star wars buck rogers uh now buck rogers you can say well steve buck rogers inspired star wars indeed indeed things like buck rogers and flash gordon from way back in the day inspired george lucas for his style of making star wars in the way he did but then <clears throat> life is a circle um in fact the lion king says it's a circle of life buck rogers then is greenlit a show is greenlit why because of the popularity of star wars so yeah thunder the barbarian ukla the mock ripping off chewy they've got laser swords you know come on and that's okay it's it's fine um and uh and and i and a lot of people act like they remember it fondly i think that's the other thing right now about the pop culture space in which we exist i hate saying that the pop culture space but it's a pop culture space um it, the other thing about people in, involved in pop culture today uh you know it's everything was so is is like the best of all time you know if it was the best it would have lasted longer let me give you a perfect example. Thundar the Barbarian. Uh, you know, people talk about, oh, I love Thundar. I love Thundar. It was the greatest. Thundar the Barbarian was awesome. Well, why did it only go two seasons? Why weren't you supporting it more as a child? You know, why didn't you watch it? Um, some There was some disconnect there. You know, why did Thundar the Barbarian only go two seasons where in a couple of years down the road, uh, Transformers and G.I. Joe would last almost in perpetuity what you know what's the deal there what's the deal um so yeah tell me about that also uh when it comes to uh things like that let's talk about the silver hawks now <clears throat> i'll be the first to tell you silver hawks ran like what then was like one season 65 episodes um but back in the day, you know, you, you they were making shows for every day, like weekday shows. Um, I love, I, I enjoyed Silverhawks. I, I love the theme song, and and I was cool with the cartoon. I recognized that it was basically Thundercats as birds in metal birds in space. Totally got that. But I still enjoyed the show as a kid never had any of the toys, you know, it wasn't something I sought out because I think I, like others, saw Silverhawks as a little bit second rate. Great theme song, a little bit second rate. So I never cared to have any of the Silverhawks figures. Also, there wasn't a lot of articulation with those things. Their, you know, their arms would come out straight and, um, and they had wings on them and they were back metalized and everything, but it wasn't my jam. And I'm sorry, I, but here's the thing. Nowadays, everyone's like, oh, Silverhawks were the best. Silverhawks were the best. No, they weren't. They, they were fine. Silverhawks were fine. Um, <clears throat> mask, Mobile Armored Strike Command, that with the hard K there. Um, I always was bothered by the fact that they tried to make, make it a, I didn't know what it was called at the time, but an acronym. And, and I always knew that command started with a C because of missile command and uh, commander, uh, death squad commander, you know, from the Star Wars line. A lot of my reading I learned to do from Star Wars figures and comic books and GI action figures, you know. I mean, obviously learned at school, but then action figures and, and such as you'd learn to read from. Um, <clears throat> I looked away to look, uh Oh, here comes Joey Marinari. He's going to give us the update. Uh, he says, finish it up. My internet just went out. His internet is just gone. Wow. That's crazy. Okay. I will wrap it up. 
What an what an extraordinary turn of events, ladies and gentlemen. Rule the galaxy is now mine. Oh, if I had a means to invite someone in, I would right now. I sure would, but I don't because though according to this, it's still recording. I'm, I have no control over bringing people in. How funny would it be to bring Scott Rifen in right now and do 20 minutes? I'm going to see uh, what what we can do. Um, Rifen. Do you still have a link to rule the ga galaxy's stream yard i couldn't bring him in though dang it i could not bring him in shoot well okay um <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me so anyhow silverhawks and everyone's like oh silverhawks the best mask is what i was talking about mask was cool because the toys were made by kenner and it was something different than Kenner had done with the Star Wars because the, the figures were a little smaller, but the, the, the cars were cool. And it was really kind of leaning into that Transformers thing. And I think Mask, I'm fortunate enough to be able to reach right here and pull this out and see. I'm not sure how many seasons Mask had, but there were many um, episodes. So I think maybe two seasons of Mask. And you won't talk about a jamming theme song. Mask had it, man. And, you know, fire away. Laser, see the laser rays fire away. Let me just see here. Let me pull up on the old Wikipedia mask TV series. Yeah, I think it only got two seasons. But again, it was daily, so it was a lot. But it was 1985. Star Wars was done. And, and so there you go. Um, <clears throat> no problem, man. I've I've been talking about Thundar the Barbarian. Rule the galaxy's mine, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. <laughs> I feel like um uh Ming, Ming the Merciless, who has taken over the world, basically. But I'm not an evil. I'm not an evil person. I'm. I always fancy myself the good guy. But I guess even the bad guys fancy themselves the good guys. Even Darth Vader. And then we brought it back. If I could have allowed someone into the studio with me, I would have completely taken this whole thing over. So um, we'll wrap it up. <clears throat> Thank you to everyone for joining uh, us here on this episode of Rule the Galaxy. I want to thank Joe for asking me on and, and let me be a part of this today. I, I hope that the front part of the conversation was not too boring. And I hope this ending part of the conversation was not too boring. Um, I was going to see how long I could go, but I, I you know, got a life. I got to get out there too. We just talked about all that. Um, <clears throat> if you want to find me, geekoutpodcast.com uh, should have the links, or at least you, you'd be able to subscribe where you need to subscribe there. Uh, just look out, look for geek out loud, wherever you get podcasts and that sort of thing. Then, um, of course, rule the galaxy here on YouTube, uh, check out the rule of the galaxy podcast, uh, like on YouTube, like, and share with your friends, subscribe and share it. Let people know what's going on. If you, if you enjoy what these guys are doing, one of the ways that you really help them out is by sharing with other people. And then the more people that watch it, the more it kind of gets locked in a little bit to the algorithm. And before you know it, I'm, I'm not cool enough to be on rule of the galaxy because they've gotten so big. So, uh, all right, everyone. Thanks so much. And I don't know how long this will end up recording. Um, I, at least I don't have to edit it. We'll, we'll see you around the galaxy. Is that how they say it? May the four, do they say may the force be with you? I don't like it when shows end with may the force be with you because number one, the force isn't real, but number two, it's like, you can, I don't know, like, okay, so there's one podcast, <clears throat> I don't know if the, how they feel about mentioning other Star Wars podcasts here, but Rebel Force Radio ends with, remember, they actually play the clip, the Force will be with you always. 
And that's fine. I like that. But what I don't like is when people are like, may the force be with you. Why? Because eh, it's not real. But also, if you're going to say something on your outro, do it yourself. So I hope I haven't completely offended the Rule of Galaxy people. So uh, until next time, may the force be with you. <laughs> <laughs>